Hello, I'm Charna Davis Weesey, and welcome to UCF Expressions. If you've ever listened to a space shuttle launch on the radio, you have surely heard today's guest's voice. Pat Duggins has been a space watcher, well, since he saw Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon from his family's television in 1969. And he spent more than 20 years following the space program as a veteran reporter. Today, he'll tell us his story and tell us about his new book. It's called The Final Countdown, NASA and the End of the Space Shuttle Program. It's so nice, you know, I feel like somebody said to me, have you ever met him? Oh, yeah. And I had to think, I really, we hadn't actually ever met in person. Yeah, I know. We were talking about that earlier. <laughs> but it's I like... feel like I have after listening to you for <laughs> 20 years since I was about nine. <laughs> the old-fashioned face for radio. Yeah, I get that all the time. Yeah. That is something, you know, when you're on radio and people hear your voice and, and they picture you in maybe different ways. You probably get that a lot. Well, I messed him up, actually, because the publicity picture in the back of the book, I was wearing a beard at the time. And then about maybe six months after we had the shots done, I kind of wake up one morning and I turn to my wife and said, I'm tired of the beard. You tired of the beard? She's like, yeah, I'm tired of the beard. So just, you know, like that. And now everybody's kind of like, they'll flip through, wait a minute, you know, like that. I sometimes find myself wearing the same tie, <laughs> just basically to cue people, yeah, 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 it's me, so let's talk about the book. That's because you weren't on television. They <laughs> like you to stay the same on television. For 40 years, you'll stay the same. Let's talk about the book. Now you, so many people that I get to meet on these shows tell me they found their passion when they were kids. And I am so jealous about that because if I was doing what I wanted to do when I was a kid, I'd be a jockey right now, <laughs> <laughs> which wouldn't have worked too well. But you were in, basically in love with space since you were a little guy. Well, I was, I was like nine. No, I was like eight when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And what's weird is, like, I've I talked to veteran astronauts. Many of them have been, you know, inspired by Neil Armstrong. But if they lived in the eastern time zone, Neil and Buzz walked on the moon at 1030 at night. So these kids were like on a school night staying up to watch these guys. Well, being an Air Force kid, my family and I, we were over in Anchorage, Alaska at Elmendorf Air Force Base, which means we were sitting down to dinner when one small step uh, for man, one giant leap for mankind became part of the American lexicon. So for us, it was like, oh, okay, big deal. Then just went back to dinner and then whatever. You know, it's one of those moments we talk about all the time. Everybody's got them. Where were you when? Being so young, do you have strong memories of that? I do. Uh, the ghostly images, the uh, of an extraordinarily young Walter Cronkite. Obviously, he was doing a lot of the the broadcasting. He probably there. seemed dull to you at the time, though. Oh, uh, <laughs> it, well, it, it, the, the parents were really excited because I remember I remember vividly when the uh, the Apollo one fire occurred, and the, the three astronauts, Grissom, Chaffee, and White, were killed. Not and remember, this was like I was six when that happened. Not so much from being aware of what was going on, but I remember my mother's face during the televised funeral when they had the, the case on with the three caskets going by. And I just, you know, being six years old, I mean, well, what does a kid know, okay? I basically just looked at my mother and said, it's okay, mom, they'll get other astronauts like that. But she was just absolutely unconsolable at oh. the time. So it was such a big part of what was going on in America at the time. So even if you were young or old or whatever like that, I mean, the, the Tang generation, as it were, it's, 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 it's really prevalent. That's really changed. I remember being very young at the time, too, and oh my gosh, everybody wanted to grow up. Astronauts were the heroes. They yeah. like, Today, it's the rap stars and the, the uh, the DUI offenders <laughs> who <laughs> keep driving their Mercedes, they, they're the heroes. But then the space program, the, yep. the final frontier really was new and it's, that's changed. Well, there's so many astronauts now. I mean, back then, I mean, when you had like the Right Stuff 7, which, you know, Gus Grissom and uh, John, uh, John Glenn and all those folks, I mean, they were on the cover of Life magazine and everybody knew their name and their wife's name and their dog's name. And now you got 200 people who basically are waiting for their chance to go up on the shuttle. And I, I write in the book that uh, somebody in the astronaut office coined the phrase that being an astronaut now is the kind of fame that you put on or take off. Because if you're an astronaut and you show up in the blue flight coveralls with all the patches, oh my gosh, this person's been in space, they want their picture with you, they want an autograph, that same person could show up in a business suit and no one would know they're there. Right, right. Their, their face is not recognizable. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the book and writing the book before we get into the parts of it. Now you have, we've got something to show you. This is like major marketing for this book. So much that you have this huge sign. Yes, uh, oh, uh, right, writing, writing the book is one thing and it's like, you know, it just takes a, a few, you know, it takes a few months if, to do that. As if by magic it yes, appears. Yes, but, but, but now my, my publisher <laughs> who thinks of everything, 
you wouldn't believe how self-conscious you are walking around at like you know bookstores and stuff like that or book signings. It's like you have the big sandwich board. The end of the world is nigh and all this sort of stuff. But actually, it's just it's just the end of the shuttle. That's it. That's basically. <laughs> I just tell I just tell everybody. My mo my mother says I never send her postcards, so this ought to shut her up. Okay, you know that that should basically take care of it. So it's just you know. But it's it's it shows that this is a really wonderful thing for an author to get a publisher to be behind you so much is incredibly wonderful and rare. Well, it's neat also because the poster's laminated. So the last few that I've been at, where there's a rainstorm. It also doubles as your umbrella, and you're in good shape there. But no, it was awfully nice of them to do, and it's a good attention getter. And it's like, hey, you know, it's the marketing of it is really amazing because writing a book can take like you know, it took me about like maybe four to six months. But then once that's done, you figured, oh my gosh, everything's taken care of. Now comes the marketing and the phone calls and the interviews and the emails and walking around with the sandwich board and all this stuff. So it's uh, well, you need a cart behind you with all the books and you sell them on the street. There we go. That's it exactly. Anything like that. Bring and me it, your books. And it's probably bring like the lamination or is yeah, probably yeah. driving the director yeah. crazy. So. There we go. So it's a sort of, sort of <laughs> pass and this off. And it's by magic. It disappears again. Yeah, there what? we go. There we go. Okay, now back, what back to What is this that. picture? Which which um, that is the lift is off one? of STS seventy seven, which was the. Um, the first flight, uh, second flight actually, of Canada's first man in space. They have their, we have our Neil Armstrong and they've got theirs, and Mark Garno was actually on that mission. And when the, um, the book was being put together, the art people simply said, well, get us a dozen photographs of the shuttle doing various things. And when I, when I saw that, uh, if you look at the way the, uh, the, the booster exhaust creates this column of black right here. Oh, I thought that was something that you guys did in post, as that we is, say. That is the original picture. And as soon as I wow. saw that, I thought, oh my goodness gracious, wouldn't that be really cool for the title? And when I suggested it, I figured the art department would come back with, yeah, authors, they think they know what they are. It's going to get out of here. But as soon as they sent me the mock ups, it's like, they now, took I'm, the idea and ran I'm, uh, it definitely compared to you, space impaired. So this was this a nighttime launch? Was this dawn? It what? was dusk. It was dusk, actually. And uh, the, the way, if you, if you look actually even somebody stayed up at night to really get this right, but look at the color gradation on the words Final Countdown. It starts off with the tan of the booster exhaust going up to the blue of the sky. Writing your book, you probably never thought that would be a consideration. In a million years. Somebody stayed up late thinking that up, and I, I just every time I call them up, be sure to tell the art people. I really thought it was cool what they did with the cover. You know, I mean, you judge a book by its cover. Well, I think you know, hey, they did a nice job. Let's talk that. about the process of going from a broadcaster to an author. And those of us who work in television and radio, yeah. we work in ten seconds, ten second increments, and yeah. we don't usually get. I mean, this show for me, doing a half hour instead of a minute thirty seconds to tell a story yeah. is an incredible luxury and you have the whole book. You probably could have made it as long as you wanted too. Well actually I wanted to keep it short mainly because like you know I, I was thinking okay would I read a 500 page book on space even if I wrote it? And, the and answer, you love space. Yes yeah, and the, the answer is absolutely no. That's why I wanted to keep it you know approachable in tone. It's not all rockets and mm -hmm. rocket fuel and it's not wonky but it's also approachable in terms of just the length. I mean you could probably put this away reading dribs and drabs you know a couple of weeks. Which I wanted. I wanted to make sure that everybody had at least a decent time of it, and it wasn't just for rocket scientists and space wonks. So, did you feel like it was a luxury to be able to tell your story without the, without the second hand going? Being in, well, I mean, being a broadcast veteran yourself, you know this. That if I'm interviewing you, and I'm listening to you respond to my questions, I'm literally editing, editing. you <laughs> in my head as we go along. So, if you say something brilliant. But if, as people, and I'm the worst one as want to do, you might slur a word, or there might be a car horn honk in the background. I mean, I literally may not be able to use that snippet of sound because it isn't broadcast quality. But talking to this, I mean, you just get on the phone, and you're making notes with an astronaut somewhere, and literally you can just simply just pick apart the details of their life forever. I mean, I was talking to Jerry Leninger, one of the astronauts who went up on the older Russian space station Mir, and I just basically said, well, I'm kind of out of questions here, so what did Mir smell like when you went in? And he thought for a moment, he said... That's a great question. Yeah. Do I want to know the answer? Actually, he came up with a great <laughs> quote there. I shouldn't say because then no one will want to buy the book. No. Oh, uh, no, there's even more. This is one <laughs> of many. <laughs> no, he came back with, smells like your grandmother's attic. Oh. Which is kind of like... I guess the, the guy's uh, used to it. it. On the one hand, you... I but thought on the it'd other be hand, worse. Yeah, well, no, actually, that, that, that's, that's about... I, actually, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, another astronaut said it was more like uh, going into someone's wine cellar because you have this moist, dank air that kind of rushes at you as you open the hatch and go through the first time. So everybody gets kind of creative when they respond, but being able to utilize that in the book was such a luxury compared to broadcasting. It's, you know, even public radio, you ask in-depth questions and stuff like that. But for this, it was like you go for an hour and just, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What did it look like? What did it feel like? What did it smell like? 
because just, that's the part we don't get to get. You know, that's the luxury. That's what maybe the reporters here, we have this amazing interview, but we don't have time to use it. Yep. And that's what's so cool about this book is the astronauts' personal feelings. I remember going to, to the Cape with uh, um, one of my kids and uh, listening to the astronaut talk about things like how he felt physically when it was taking off. Yep. And that's something that we would love to know and we don't have the time to hear in the usual broadcast terms, but you can tell so, that. That's it. And uh, some of those stories are kind of like, you know, not especially comfortable because if you look at the inside of the shuttle, I mean, they're wearing like a 90 pound bright orange pressure suit. And when they get in that craft, I mean, they have to get shoehorned in there. And I kind of describe in the book how like, you know, the shuttle is upright when it launches, but it lands like an airplane. But when you go in, that means you're going into the hatch. If you look to the left, what is the wall at launch time will be the floor when you land. And when you look to the right, the wall on the right will be the ceiling of the lower part of the cabin and the floor of the upper part of the, so it's totally topsy-turvy and bizarre, but it's something that the astronauts have to basically live with if they're gonna go up into space. They were also talking about, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna, it's a blonde moment, but I don't remember the astronaut we heard talk, but he was one of the ones who walked on the moon. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, he was talking about what it was like to actually walk over to, uh, the end of a crater mm. and stop and not know what's on the other side and then all of a sudden realizing that there was this drop <laughs> <laughs> and it's another part of the bravery that you don't get that you don't understand because you can only get the little bits you know that was something that was so momentous in his life but he really couldn't tell that story until he was in an auditorium many years later. Well, I wrap up the book by talking about what it might be like to go to the planet Mars because obviously no one's ever been. But you know, if you if you move to a new neighborhood, for example, what do you do? You talk to somebody who's already there and you ask them where are the good schools, where's a good place to get a haircut, where do you get a good pizza? Mm -hmm. Well, no one's been to Mars, but the guys who sent where's the there Mars a large rover, drop off? There you that go. Will that, send me to I my was going to say. There you go. It's like whoa. <laughs> but you know, uh, the the guys who sent up the Mars rovers, Spirit and Opportunity vicariously have been to Mars, so that's one of the people I spoke to was Steve Squires, who was always good for a sound bite, let me tell you, and literally said, okay, if I'm walking around or you're walking around in a, in a, in a spacesuit on the surface of Mars in the two spots where the rovers landed, what is it going to be like? And his descriptions are just amazing, just as alien as, as you can imagine. You know, you talk about the descriptions and them being there, them being there through video, mm -hmm. but we were really on the moon contrary to probably what some people want to believe. <laughs> and you talk also about the preservationists of the areas yep. around the landing. There's more than just the flag there. And there are some people very worried that if other countries go, they may disturb what may one day be archeological finds, or probably is already. Yeah, uh, big concern has already been voiced by NASA's top administrator, Michael Griffin, that the Chinese probably will beat us back to the moon. And the concern that you raised was that when, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on their, their lunar module, they, they landed, they walked around, that sort of thing, but NASA wasn't really all that positive that the lunar module would take off again. So just before they, they left, they were told to basically open the hatch, anything you don't need, throw out. Lighten it up. Yes, two whole spacesuits, tools to grab moon rocks, food packs still wrapped in plastic in the scatter zone around the outside of the lunar module. And as any archaeologist will tell you is, you can find this really cool, you know, artifact, but if you don't know where it was, then it doesn't have any archaeological value. So that's what they're worried about, that's it, that's it. So they're afraid the Chinese or whoever may wind up going back to the moon. And basically, international law says that nobody owns the moon. And international salvage law apparently is so murky that there's no guarantee that if you go to the moon, you can basically take anything you want, put it in your private collection, give it to a museum, sell it on eBay, and nobody can do anything about it. Now, I'm sure NASA will have something to say about that, but right now it's so murky, and anytime the law is murky, I mean, that, that's what really makes people nervous. And maybe they bring up a T-shirt, uh, we went to the moon and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. We have so, more to, so much more to talk about. We'll be right back after this message. Greatness doesn't care how early it is or how late. Greatness doesn't care if anyone's watching. Greatness doesn't care about your clothes, your hair, or your music. The only thing greatness cares about is getting an opportunity. Where will you get yours? At UCF, we believe no dream is too big and no goal out of reach. On the fields, the courts, and in the classrooms, UCF stands for opportunity.
Welcome back to UCF Expressions. We're talking with veteran space reporter, award-winning radio broadcaster, Pat Duggins, and we're talking about his book, The Final Countdown, NASA and the End of the Space Shuttle Program. Now, you talk a lot in the book about how Apollo was a mission waiting to be reached a goal ready to be waiting to be reached but the space shuttle program was complete opposite of that yeah it was more of a vehicle looking for something to do yeah well when nasa first came up with the idea of a of a, of a shuttle uh, once neil armstrong stepped on the moon that that whooshing sound was nasa's budget going away so they had to have something afterwards so they wanted to have a two-stage totally reusable vehicle that would go up to a space station as, as the name implies, it would shuttle things back and forth. Well, Congress look at, took a look at that and immediately had sticker shock, and they said, okay, fine, you're not going to get a space station. We'll give you half the money that you want for the space shuttle. So basically what they had was a vehicle that was kind of like going on grocer's errands for whoever would hire it for the first 17 years of its life. And then they start building the International Space Station, which gave the, the shuttle a mission that had been waiting for for so long, but to wait 17 years to come into your own, that's, that's, that's kind of tough. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Because each time it goes up, it's what? A billion dollars. I, I didn't. I, that my, my, that number is in my mind from somewhere in the the vast storages of reporting, and I didn't know if that was true. It is a billion dollars. That's that's what, that's that's what that's what NASA refers to. Because if you think about the the cost of training the crew, fueling the vehicle, launching the vehicle, all of the support that goes on, because it's not just the seven or so astronauts that are up there, but you got like mission control. You've got if something breaks, they got to bring in the contractors, and that happens almost every time they go up. So it's 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 extraordinarily involved. What also people may not realize is that there's more that comes out of it than that particular mis mission. Some of the things we use every day came out of the space program. Oh, uh, it, it, it's easier to come up with ideas like this because it's like, uh, you know, in the old days because it's, uh, time, days were simpler. But when they set up the, uh, the Atlas rockets, they had a problem with water backing up in the... Uh, in the, in the fuel lines, and they couldn't fly it that way. So NASA said, okay, well, we got to come up with an idea. So they said, all right, why don't we just come up with a chemical formula, a water dispersion formula that'll make the, the water go away and the engines will work. And they tried 39 of these water formulas or WD formulas before they came up with the one that worked, which was the WD-40, which not only fixed the Atlas rocket, but if you ever had a squeaky hinge or a stuck <laughs> doorknob. So many things. That's, it's, am it's, it's amazing. Right. And you and I could retire off what WD-40 is probably doing And that's right just now. one of dozens of things. That's it. So a lot comes out of the space program that we don't really give it credit for every day. We can't talk about the shuttle program without talking about your first big story, your first story, <sighs> the, the, the Challenger. Um, it's another one of those where were you when moments. Yep. And uh, we were reporters at the time, and it was at that time, uh, what is your p paragraph called, Don't Call Unless It Blows Up? Yep. It was at the time where I remember our assignment editor, who was a dear person, a very wonderful journalist, said, it's like a bus stop at this point. People were really, it became routine mm -hmm. for us. It was no longer sitting out, running outside gate mouth to see it go up, which we're starting to do again. Yep. And I remember Krista McAuliffe was going off the teacher, and I remember one of our producers saying, oh, just call me if it blows up. Yeah. I think from reading this, probably that was said in every newsroom in the country. It's, Without a doubt. It, it's not a big deal anymore. You couldn't buy network airtime for a shuttle story. In fact, my wife and I were at a, uh, a booksellers conference up in Atlanta, and you can't go to Atlanta without visiting the Coca-Cola Museum. And sure enough, they had the Coca-Cola dispenser that was created for Space Shuttle Challenger that went up on the mission prior to a Challenger blowing up, and that was the big story. You had poor Story Musgrave there basically having to do a Pepsi challenge between the machine from Pepsi and the machine with Coke and having to decide which of the warm, flat soft drinks he liked best. And I think he said both of them tasted really good, and that was basically the big news on the shuttle prior to Challenger. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Uh, we were out on another story, and um, I, a photographer I worked with for many, many years, and I remember we looked in the sky and saw that now infamous, terrible plume of vapor and smoke, and and we we, we were listening, he always listened to rock and roll. We were listening to his head-banging rock and roll on the radio, it was giving <laughs> me a headache. And somebody pulled up honking to us in the news truck, and we rolled down the window and they said, what what happened? What happened to the space shuttle? And we couldn't find anything on the radio. I guess it must have just happened. And we actually went into those rent-a-center places mm. where they had all the TVs. And that's how, as news people, we found out what was happening because there was so much chatter and so many things going on in the radios. We couldn't get in touch with the station. And I remember there were people coming in off the street to the store, mm. gate mouth, looking at this, thinking, this can't be, this just, this was not supposed to happen. Mm. You actually were assigned to the story. Well, 
I was assigned to the story as it happened because I was the only one in the newsroom who grabbed the keys to the news car, grabbed a recorder, and I followed the uh, the mushroom cloud out. And parts were still coming down. So you as were I where, where physically were you in I, town? Uh, I was physically working on another story because remember and nobody was interested in the shuttle whatsoever. Right. And I remember seeing one of my account representatives. Were you who, in Brevard or were I you? I was. I was in Orlando. You were in Orlando. In Orlando, one of the one of our sales reps whizzing by the window and I'm kind of like what's going on with that so I kind of stuck my head out I said what's going on they said the shuttle blew up and I'm like yeah, right and then I figured about a tenth of a second later let me double check this so I went over to a production room where we were taking the NASA feed and you just never saw a group of the most pasty faced looking people in your life that's when grab the news car keys grab the recorder I'm shooting out into the uh, the news car heading following the mushroom cloud out to the Cape yelling into the microphone get me their security get me their security giving them my, so my social security number which on an open line probably was not the smartest thing on the but face then, of the planet to do. It, it was much. back in the mid 80s so what the heck <laughs> and the very first uh, people that I encountered as I was getting my uh, my badge straightened out with NASA were a group of 10 year olds from uh, from Citrus County who basically showed up for no other reason to see a space shuttle launch and they saw something totally different. And you you talk about one particular child interviewed them and kept the tape because I figured one of these days it was going to come in handy so as soon as I started writing the book I started calling around to seeing if 20 years later if I could find any of these kids and I never forget it was like 2004 my wife and I we would not heard from anybody my wife and I are at the house we're putting up the Christmas tree my cell phone rings and I'm kind of like hello it's like is this Pat Duggins I'm like yes who's this oh this is Jenny Carter he interviewed me 20 years ago about Challenger clunk and then Needless to say, we set up the interview. She's married, happy, up in Atlanta, working, uh, working a, ba a banking job somewhere with her wife and her, with her husband and her dog, and just for that generation, that was their John F. Kennedy assassination. That was younger folks 9/11. I mean, getting back to the uh, knowing where you were and what you were doing. I mean, it made just an incredible. And they were there. Impression on it, yeah. Just and it, and it. especially for children at the time, they felt a bond or a kinship because there was a teacher there. Oh yeah, I mean uh, Jenny had, you know, she, she considered herself to be a space geek and she just had a picture of, you know, Krista McAuliffe and Judy Resnick and Dick Scobie up over her bed and just she had a little kitty camera with her and everybody said just keep taking pictures, to keep taking pictures and I quote the kids basically they said, well, you knew there was a problem because the boosters were going off in two directions and Jenny's quote was like, you know, this isn't the way I expected it to turn out. I always thought it would be great to have a teacher in space. Right. And we go through our careers uh, with this saying, a lot of us say, going through life with one eye closed, kind of like looking through the lens of a camera. And yeah. when you're in the middle of something that is tragic or dangerous or totally insane, which sometimes you, you are as a journalist, you don't realize until you get home that evening and it hits you what you've seen and what you've experienced. Yeah. Was it like that for you? It was absolutely a blur. In fact, uh, fast forwarding a few years to the, uh, the loss of Space Shuttle Columbia, in 2003. I tell that one from the aspect of uh, Weekend Edition, which is a program from National Public Radio, right. and tell it basically from what they, what, 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 what they went through at the time, because they were, they were worried about, oh, we're trying to get this interview from this guy from The Economist magazine, we're about to go to war in Iraq, you know, being, mm -hmm. you know, February of 2003, and they just kind of sit down in front of their computers, and the Associated Press basically says, Columbia late. They were trying to tell everybody that something was up, but they couldn't come out and say it because nobody really knew. But everybody knew, looking at that, saying, the shuttle can't be late. I mean, if they start the trip, it's going to come from there, and it's going to go here, and it's unpowered, so it's got to be down at a certain time or there's something wrong. And then a couple of minutes later, they followed up on the wires with the words, Columbia, Columbia lost. lost. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. And uh, they actually had some, some conversation with Columbia right before the last transmission, didn't they? Yeah, because they, they knew that... Not to be too graphic about it, but when the uh, the piece of foam hit the leading edge of the shuttle's wing, when you come down through the atmosphere and your the belly of the shuttle is scraping the atmosphere, you're getting 3,000 degrees of heat. That's pouring through this hole into the inside of the shuttle, and the shuttle, for you know all of its sophistication, is an aluminum airplane. So all of a sudden, you start losing sensors, you start losing control, you start popping tires, and everybody on mission control is seeing all these sensors basically go dark, and then all of a sudden they knew they lost a landing gear which for the shuttle, I mean, it's got, you know, the two main gears at the back and one under the nose. You lose any of those, the astronauts basically have to ditch in the ocean. So they knew that there was a problem. And the last thing uh, Charlie Hobaugh, one of the astronauts who was actually talking to the Columbia crew by radio said, you know, we, 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 did, we didn't hear whether or not you acknowledged the, the fact that we just told you that you lost your, your tires. And then uh, Rick Husband, who's the other astronaut, said, Roger, uh. And that was the point when the shuttle literally 
banked onto its back, and then the whole vehicle just shattered because the top is not built to take that heat. So with that hole, there's more drag. So the shuttle goes like this to reduce its speed, but when it caught up with it, onto its back, and that was the end. And when the people who work at the Cape, when this happens, it's as awful as it is for us to watch. It's like a family member. It's a questioning of how was I in some way involved. It's much more dramatic, and they're much more grief-stricken than we could ever imagine. Yes, in fact, there was uh, there were unconfirmed reports following Challenger of a lot of a lot of engineers at NASA literally, you know, going to the hospital with heart problems because it was so traumatic for them. And a lot of these guys, when you ask them questions, that the rocket scientists, I mean, you know, they they give you the very straightforward answers, you know, very analytical. But going back to Columbia, there was one point where I was uh, able to see the wreckage in a hangar, and Mike Line Leinbach, who was the the launch director. Very soft-spoken guy, very straightforward, very professional. I mean, you could just, you know, you just almost see him getting misty as he described, you know, just how Columbia just fought to stay alive and and then how it didn't work out. Have they recovered from it? Yes, I think. But then again, maybe no. To be honest with you, I think always. Can you ever? Can you ever? Really? It's just like you know, they they push ahead, and you listen to them at the press conferences. Okay, if there's a uh, chipped tile on uh, Endeavor, they're going to do all of this to try and be uh, proactive, and da 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 da. But I, I don't know how you could possibly get over that because you work so closely with these people, and there are only five space shuttles. So I mean, each time you lose one, it's like losing a very precious national asset. On top of the fact you just lost seven colleagues who've been uh, involved in the accident too. So I really come to think of it, I don't know how anybody could get over that. Even the agency mm -hmm. to move on. Yeah. And 2010, we're getting very close to the to the last liftoff. Yeah, it's going to be really the end of an era. It is, and we're already uh, speculating on where the shuttles are going to go afterwards. Because I think that the Kennedy Space Center wants one. I know Johnson wants one. And for heaven's sake, you know the Smithsonian is going to want one. So it's going to be interesting as to who, as to who gets what. And then we start thumbing rides with the Russians because there's no way for Americans to get into space until maybe 2015, and that's when they come up with this new crew capsule. That's the Orion. Sounds like the making of a new book. Uh, <laughs> got one or two left in me. Who knows? You know, we'll see about that. Final countdown: NASA and the end of the space shuttle program. Pat Duggins, I think we need about three hours to continue talking. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Much success on this. I know it's going to be, people are going to love it. Thank you, Toronto. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on UCF Expressions.